Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. Today we're talking leadership. And I can tell you right now that your leadership skills, they need some help. Here's the thing. Everybody thinks they're a good leader until somebody tells them they're not. Well, I'm here today to tell you that you can use some work on your leadership skills. And I could use some work with my tongue. No, seriously, you need work on your leadership skills. And here's why. You're watching this now, and we're probably two or three months into recovering from the worst pandemic in over a century, so you haven't interacted with people on a face-to-face -face level in a very long time. So maybe you lost your edge from an empathy perspective, or maybe you lost your edge from a follow-up perspective, or maybe you lost your edge from a leadership communication perspective. Well, in the next... 30 minutes, we're going to help you fine tune those skills and get back on your A game. So you don't wanna miss this episode of our show. I've got Karen Colligan with us and she's a leadership expert. So get ready, get a pen and paper. You're gonna need to take some notes. If you're driving, you're gonna wanna pull over for this episode of The Inside BS Show. Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. How did you become a leadership expert? Yeah, Dave, thanks for having me. Thrilled to be here. Uh, so I come out of tech. In the last five years of tech, what I did is I developed initiatives on how to attract, develop, and retain top talent. And that whole thing was around leadership development. Who am I as a leader? Career development, mentoring. And so I recognize that what happened in our organization is people would be really, really great at an expertise. And then what happened, Dave, is they say, you're great at this. Therefore, we're going to make you a leader. And oh, by the way, we're not going to give you any training. And, and so what we did is we come up behind them and kind of sweep it up and help them really recognize what skills do I need? What am I great at? What am I really not so great at? And how am I gonna put that package together so that I can lead a team? It's a set of competencies. It is not a nice to have. So that's how I got into it. And when I left corporate and I decided to create people think, I thought, well, I get to do it the way I wanna do it. And what do I wanna do? What do I care about? I care about people. And so I'm going to focus on leadership and te team development. And I haven't waited since. That's great. Since. I, I think you hit on something there that I think is the one of the biggest disservices we do in business. You know, if, we, if this was an army, it would be like taking your best sniper and instead of using the talent that this individual has to, you know, pick off key people in the enemy's organization, you then take that sniper and you say, you're going to be a general. Congratulations. And the sniper has no training in strategic thinking. They have no training in communications. They have no training in team building or organization. And you're losing someone who has the best talent for one thing, and you're putting them in a position where they're going to fail. Let's talk about who make the best leaders. If we're not gonna take the highly specialized, talented people, like for example, in business and sales, right? We do this all the time. We take the best salespeople and we say, great, we're now gonna take all of that revenue and we're gonna remove it and we're gonna make you the sales leader. And the person goes, well, I guess if that's the only way I can move up in this company. So Karen, how do we then look at our organization, look at our teams and decide where the next generation of leaders is gonna come from? If it's not the superstar at a specific skill, how do we figure it out? Well, one of the things is to ask. So what we really recognize within organizations is some people, Dave, are really great at what they do. So I'm a salesperson. I love being a salesperson. I don't want to be a leader. I want to work with the customer, the relationship. I want to grow the business. Okay, great. Stay that way. What we have to do is find out who on a career path says, you know what? I do want to become a leader. And I know that I don't have the skills and talent to do it. So therefore, I need you to train me. I need to recognize what is leadership in this organization, what do I aspire to be within this organization? And then how are you going to help me get to where I need to be in this organization? Right, so as we, as we look over our teams, we say, all right, who wants to be a leader? A bunch of hands go up, right? How do we have the conversation with the folks who 
are not a fit right now. I mean, do we, I think we, we need to probably create another success track for people in their area of competency. So, you know, one of the things that sales is good at, there's a lot of things that sales organizations are not good at, but one of the things that most sales organizations are good at is they're good at rewarding and recognizing top producers so that people can climb the ladder in a sales organization without ever having to manage people or without ever having to lead people, right? How do we have the conversation with folks that says, hey, listen, I know you want to be, you know, the next CEO of the company, but you're, you're too valuable where you are. And, you, you know, we're going to make you, we're going to teach you how to be an example for other people. How do we have that conversation? And do we need to create separate tracks so that not only are leaders recognized and rewarded in organizations, but people who are outstanding at specific competencies are recognized. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. There has to be multiple tracks. And as I just indicated, if I'm a salesperson, I don't want to go into leadership role. I need a, I need a growth track to be able to do that. So Dave, what's interesting about that is what we have to think about is leaders, um, you know, are they made? Are they born? You know, everybody goes through that kind of uh, question. And I say, again, it's a set of competencies. So if you have someone who says, I want to become a leader and I want to be on that track and they're not competent and you don't think they're going to be able to, well, then you have to be able to have that a, a difficult conversation with them and keep them on the track they are. Here's what happens. If I say to you, Dave, I, I want to be a leader. And you say, Karen, you know, you're growing the revenue. We need you to stay here. What you're telling me in essence is my voice for me isn't as important as the revenue for you. So we're in the middle of a great resignation. We've had 4 million people leaving jobs every month since July of 2021. What do you think I'm going to do? You're not respecting me because I'm making dollars for you. Well, you know what? I'm over there and I'm going to look over there and I'm going to say, I'd love to stay, got to go because this career is about me. And so me. one of the things I, I've done throughout my career when that's happened, and thankfully I don't have people to manage right now other than other than the, the team that helps me get stuff done every day. Um, one of the things I've done over the years is I've said to that person, okay, here's your first task as a leader help us find somebody to replace what you're currently doing. And that is, has been a great litmus test. The best will will say, I already got somebody. Dave, I, we're, I'm already doing it, right? And the, the people who are taken aback by that, you know, unfortunately, they're probably not going to be a good fit for a leadership role anyway. And we need to really face the fact that our vision for them is not congruent with their self-awareness. So let's talk about the specifics of, um, of leadership and let's talk about how self-awareness comes into play, right? I, I think one of the most valuable things that anybody, you know, call it a competency, call it innate ability that anybody can possess is a sense of self-awareness and uh, uh, an idea that there are areas where I need to develop. How do we talk to people who are moving into a leadership role about self-awareness? Yeah, it's really huge. In fact, I um, am working with a client right now that their self-awareness um, is on the lower scale. And so what I'll say about self-awareness is this. If I don't understand who I am, then how the heck am I going to understand who my team is to help inspire and lead them? So self-awareness to me is the key. And um, People Think has a program called Keep It Real Leadership. And Dave, that is for new and advancing leaders who really haven't had training. And, and we're, we upskill them so that they can help build teams, retain talent, have the confidence to be able to do that. The first thing we do, our first module is all about self-awareness. Who am I? What am I great at? Like I said earlier, what am I not so great at? And we have to be able to say, you know what? I'm not great at this. And, and the best leaders do a couple things. The best leaders hire people smarter than them uh, and surround themselves with people who are smarter than them in areas that, that, that is not their expertise. Brilliant. 
Second thing, and you mentioned it, is as soon as I have someone who gets into a leadership role, I always say to them, now you need to build your succession plan. Who's behind you that can take over so you can continue to create your career path? Because if you don't have somebody behind you, you ain't going nowhere. So self-awareness, unbelievable, and 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 Dave, I can imagine that you and I have stories about people who think, whoa, I'm so strong, I'm so smart, I'm inspiring people, and really they're not. So uh, really, really critical. So I, I would imagine uh, that communication has got to be up, at, up near the top from a leadership perspective. Talk to us a little about um, some of the some of the communication skills that good leaders have and that good leaders need to continue to hone as they advance throughout their careers. So communication right up there. And in order to be good at communication, you have to be a curious human being. In order to be a good communicator, you have to listen. I like to say you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You don't tell people how they're gonna do it. You ask people, how do you think it can be done? And then you work with them. So a great communication strategy is to have the conversation. A great communication strategy is to be able to understand more than just what they do for a living, but who they are as a human being. Because if you don't understand who someone is as a human being, why should you trust them? Why should they trust you? The other part about communication from a leadership perspective, Dave, is you have to be vulnerable and you have to be willing to tell people who you are as a human being because it's not just the hard skills. It's all that emotional intelligence that makes a leader a great leader. So I have to be vulnerable in order to ask my, uh, my team to be vulnerable back to me. And I have to. Yeah, ask. I love that. Vulnerability is so important. And I work with a lot of professionals and particularly lawyers. One of the things that is most difficult for them is to demonstrate some sort of vulnerability. And what I found over the over the years is that like trial lawyers who have have tried cases in front of juries, they get it. Right. They get it because they know that if they accidentally knock the glass of water over on the table or if they, you know, just uh, stumble when they're getting up from, uh, you know, from the table to walk around to hand uh, an, an, an exhibit to a witness or if they, uh, you know, stutter a little bit at the beginning. That's how they connect with a jury, because the jury then sees them as more human. And so often, younger people, and I say younger people, I mean tenured, younger in tenure in a leadership role, will think to themselves, I can't display any vulnerability because people will think that's weakness. When the opposite is true because, <clears throat> pardon me, see there's some vulnerability right there. The opposite is true because that's how people relate to each other. Oh, you know, he, he had trouble with the word nuclear and he said it nucle nuclear in the beginning and he corrected himself. I used to do that all the time. This person's just like me. I can relate to them. So vulnerability is so, so critical. You know, Karen, one of the things I think uh, I, we, we should explore a little bit is this notion of leaders being born or, you know, people becoming leaders over time. And I'll tell you, my evolution in this came when um, I started coaching my son in sports. My son uh, is now 13. He'll be he'll be 14 this year. And he's been playing sports since he was four and a half, five years old. And one of the things that I made sure I instilled in him was, listen, if there's if there's a uh, a crappy job to be done, if there's a you know if there's something difficult that has to be handled, you should volunteer to do that because you're setting an example for other people on your team. And the natural evolution of that was people on the team then looked to him when times got tough to see how he behaved. Right. So basically, I was teaching him leadership competencies while, you know, not calling them leadership competencies. Up until that point, and I was old when I became a dad, my son was born when I was 40, up until that point, I kind of thought that, you know, people either had these this, you know, innate ability to lead people or they didn't. Raising a child, and we've done the same thing now with my daughter who's who's three years younger, 
you know, teaching people, hey, you stand up for others when people are picking on them. You are the voice for people who aren't in the room. And we do this because these are just, and this is something else that you talk about all the time, these are just good values. Well, it turns out that both of my kids Turn, they're people who other people look to now when times get tough. They look to them when they want to see how to react to things. So my kids are becoming leaders without them consciously deciding to do it. So that's how my evolution from being born to being able to train this into people came to be. Now, maybe I just have kids who are prone to this. What are your thoughts along the line? Can we train people in how to become leaders? Yes. And there's a huge debate about this. I debate this all the time. Just last week, I was debating this with someone who was a very senior person in a large financial institution. And she absolutely believed that you are born as a leader, end of story, period. And, and I really was taken aback by the strength of her, of her, of, of her commitment to that. Because you just explained a beautiful example of how people can learn behaviors to become leaders at whatever age you are you have to be willing to learn you have to be willing to make mistakes you have to will be willing to put your your nose out there your feet out there you have to be willing to have people not agree with you if you have that willingness and that builds your confidence then you can become a leader because it means that you will upskill you will recognize what you're good at and recognize what you're not good at are there some born leaders? Of course there are. And if I want to be a leader and I don't have the set of competencies, I can put, I, I can study and I can become a leader. I hands down. That's yeah. Yes. I, I think the part of being a leader is it, it starts with empathy, right? We talked about self-awareness. We talked a little bit about communication. I think now we we need to talk a little bit about empathy because I you know in growing up I didn't I didn't have somebody like you who could say hey these are the competencies and you know here's how you can make yourself better at these competencies so I I studied people who were you know good at building teams people who were good at getting people to do difficult things and whether it was the world of sports or later on in my career it was business but you know watching World War II movies and contrasting somebody like Omar Bradley with George Patton and different styles and learning that, you know, Omar Bradley was known as the soldier's general. He was known as a person who would lead from the front and he changed and adapted to some of the things that his troops were telling him was going on, whereas Patton was the kind of person who was a very command and control and, you know, do things my way because I've had all this experience, I've had all this knowledge, I've had all this schooling, and both were effective yet one rose to be the leader of all of our, uh, you know, of all of our troops and the other, you know, was relegated to middle management. Although, you know, history looks on them both fondly. This to me is one of the key elements of, uh, of leadership and that's empathy, listening and connecting with other people. What are some of the best ways we can teach people in our businesses, in our organizations, to be more empathetic? Mm -hmm. Well, to be more empathetic, you have to have a growth mindset. And a growth mindset means that I'm willing to learn more. And it doesn't matter what stage of your career or your life you are at. So it's about curiosity it will help with the empathy. It's about appreciation that people are different than me and unique. And I want to learn from that uniqueness. It's about recognizing that um, I need to um, really look again. I, I'll use the word curiosity because I can't stay away from it. If I'm not curious about who you are as a human being, then how can I have empathy for you? How can I care about you? And so then it goes back to the self-awareness thing. So again, self-awareness that people are unique and that's what we do at Keep It Real. We talk, we talk about every single leader is unique and be the leader only you can be. And if I can respect that in you, then I can have empathy for you. Otherwise, 
I'm not a leader. I'm a manager. And that's a whole different ballgame and all. Yeah. Other all right. So I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to take a minute and think about it. Uh, and the question is, should we train everyone to be leaders and let those who aren't leaders self-select out? Or do we need to become better ourselves as business owners, business uh, business leaders, business managers at deciding who could be a leader and who couldn't be a leader and just give those people the training? I want you to think about that because right now I need to remind people that we are brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. You hear me talk about them every show. Uh, I think this is our 82nd or 83rd show now this year, and they have been a great sponsor for us during the course of this year. Sandrowski provides fantastic high-level accounting services to people all over the United States. Now, Two of the services that I really like are Sandrowski's business valuation service and their ability to provide litigation support. And these two things go hand in hand. So if you're a lawyer and you're listening to this, uh, you're a litigator and you have a contentious matter and two people are fighting over the value of a business, maybe there's a breakup or maybe there's a merger and they can't agree on what the value of the business is, the other side is gonna get their people to value the business you'll get your people, and I think you should choose Sandrowski, and here's the reason why. They've been doing business valuations for 35 years. They've done thousands of them, but even more importantly, if it's a contentious situation, you need someone to explain the valuation methodology and how you came to the value of the business to the court, perhaps to a jury, to a mediator or an arbitrator, and this is where Sandrowski really excels. The people who head up their business valuation team are also college professors, so they're well-versed at breaking down complex subjects and explaining them to people who aren't familiar with them. So if you need to explain a valuation to a judge, you can't have somebody who's up here when the judge's knowledge of financials is down here. They need to be able to communicate with a jury, with the court, on their level. Sandrowski is fantastic at this. I want you to call Sandrowski today. You can reach out to them at 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, they're a CPA firm with a different perspective. We're also brought to you by My Revenue Roadmap Guide. You're a professional, you wanna grow your business, the best way to do that is through relationship-based business development. There's no funny business. We don't we don't work with our clients on advertising. We're not going to help you put up billboards all up and down the highway. That's not our thing. If you're doing that and you want to learn about relationships, I'm your guy. If you're not doing that and you want to learn about relationships, I'm your guy. But here's where you can find a free resource. You don't have to do anything. Go to Revenue Roadmap Guide. Just enter your contact info. You'll be automatically eligible to download my business development guide. It's the same guide I use with my clients. I want to give it to you for free. RevenueRoadmapGuide.com. Enter your contact info. Download it. Customize it for your professional practice today. It will help you grow your business quickly. All right, we're talking with Karen Colligan, and she's an expert on leadership. She's the founder of People Think. You can reach out to her at 415-710-2264, 415-710-2264. All right, Karen, before I read those spots, we I asked you a question about leadership. So let's go back and talk about leadership and leadership from that perspective. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are every single person is a leader. No question about it. And I don't care if you're a receptionist. I don't care if you're a project manager. I don't care if you're in sales. I don't care if you're a CEO. Every single person has to look and view their work as if this. I am the leader of this and I have to be accountable. I have to be reliable and I have to get it done. So that's my first thought. In terms of leadership and, and the complexity around it, because it's so fuzzy, Dave, because no matter if I work at one place, then I go to the second place, then I go to the third place, everybody's defining, leader, defining leadership differently. What I have to know in the organization that I am in, what is leadership? How do I define leadership? And one of the questions I asked in my training is if I go around the room and ask everybody to define leadership for your organization and there's 15 people in the room, how many definitions do you think I'm going to I mean, get? Probably going to get 15. Yeah. 15. Yeah. 15. And so that is what has to occur at the organizational level. 
Who am I as a leader and what, what do I need to understand in order to progress? And you know what? At this point in time, Dave, organizations are not doing it. So it's fuzzy. It's complicated. You, you know, talk about an accounting firm. If, if you talk about an accounting firm, everybody's like, oh, I think I get what they do. If you say I'm a leader, people are like, ah, what? Ah? Oh, I know what a leader means for me. It's different for what it means for everybody else. So it gets fuzzy. It gets complicated. And yet every single person is. Yeah, a leader. no, that's really I think that's a great way to think about it. That's a great way to to look at it. You know, we, I, I used to tell my team when I, I, I managed over 300 people at one point, and I used to tell my team that we're going to treat everybody as a leader. And when times really get tough, the true leaders are going to emerge. <laughs> and, you know, I, we, we saw this, um, we saw this during adversity. So I, uh, I led a business in Manhattan during 9-11, we had, uh, we had 180 people in Manhattan, about a third of those were downtown. And you remember, uh, I, well, maybe you weren't in New York at the time, but those, those who are listening, those who are watching will remember, right after September 11th for about six months, it was a really tough time to be doing anything in New York City. We, we found out in our business who the real leaders were and we found out by simply watching how they carried themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. Everyone was anxious. In fact, some people were just flat out scared. In the days, I mean, I had to open the office the day after on September 12th, and I didn't know if a plane was gonna fly into the building next to me. My office was right next to Grand Central Station. I took the subway to work. I didn't know if somebody was going to release some sort of gas in the subway, but we did what we had to do. And those people who were real leaders showed themselves during the time of adversity. And there are several people who stepped up to the plate that I didn't expect. And I was really glad that we had given everybody the same type of leadership training because those people who stepped up, had I been forced to pick them, I would have never picked those people. You know, it's my own vulnerability, my own failing as a, as a boss. I just wasn't good at determining who was gonna step up in a crisis. They showed me. So if people ask me that question, I would say train everybody who wants it because you never know what who adversity is going to reveal to be a true leader. Now, Karen, I wanna ask you a question about the less sexy stuff, right? So after 9-11 in adversity, you know, people who are moving to the front of the pack, everybody talks about those people, right? But we don't talk about the leaders who do the crappy jobs every day that nobody else wants to do. So let's give some advice to the folks who are out there now who want to demonstrate to their company, to their boss, to their clients that they are true leaders. What are some of the things they can do to demonstrate that they want to fulfill that role when it's available? Right. Well, the first thing they have to do is communicate to their leaders that they're interested in that. Second thing they can do is take on uh, projects that they would not normally take on or ask their leader for additional responsibility. They can ask for a visible um, project that maybe they have to present to a group of people that they wouldn't normally present to. They can ask if they can work in another part of the organization and spend 20% of their time over there so they can learn another part of the business to bring back to the business. What has to happen in that circumstance, Dave, is me, um, if this is an interest to me, I have to take a proactive approach. I have to have options and I have to go to my leader with solutions of this is what I'd like to do. This is where I want to go. And I have four different ways of how I can get there. Can you help me with either of these? And or do you have other ideas for me based on who I am? So if you don't take a proactive approach and you sit back and you're waiting, then you're just going to be waiting for a long time and the train ain't ever going to come. Great to advice. Station. I love that. Um, I think one of the things I want to I want to touch on before before you give us three things to focus on is politics, right? There's politics in every work environment. There's politics in every group. If you're if you're volunteering, there's politics, right? So how do we how does a leader manage the politics and also, how do you communicate in a direct and transparent way without being passive aggressive 
and still navigate the political waters. There's a, there's a lot in there. So give us your best advice on, on managing politics in any organization and trying to become a leader in a political environment. Yeah. So I'll give it to you from both perspectives. So if I'm a leader, what I have to do is I have to communicate to my team who I am as a leader. I have to communicate to my team my expectations of you as a, a team member. And I have to be able to really let my team know what my values are and what I'm going to stand for. So if you can do those three things politically, then you have every reason to be able to say this is not acceptable behavior. So because you've got the expectations. If I'm sitting there as an employee or a team member and I'm looking at my leader and this is going on and this one's whispering over there and that one's whispering over there, if I understand the expectations of the team and there are group norms because the leader and, and the team has put them together, I can go to the leader and say, okay, there, I'm not going to tell you who, but there's you know things going on and we need to have it addressed. I'm not in a position to do that. You are and I need you to do that for the team. Otherwise, we will not be a high performing team. So it goes both ways. And again, it goes back to, am I going to take responsibility and accountability? And if I'm not, then shut yeah. up. Yeah. No, I, I think, I think you're a hundred percent right. And you know, one of my philosophies has always been, I would rather just get it out on the table and deal with it than let it simmer under the surface. So, you know, if there's, if there's a problem, well, Let's, there, are, there are problems that can be opportunities, and then there are problems that we create and we make worse through our behavior. I think the second part, we can eliminate those if we create an environment where we say, look, if something's not right, I'm the first person, you know, as the boss, I'm the first person I got to know about it so that I can fix it, right? If there's an undercurrent of something, whether it's about me personally or about the work environment, I want to fix it. So I think we go back to the empathy and the communication competencies where, you know, if you really truly come to the table as an empathetic person who's interested in making the environment better in any way possible, and you communicate that effectively, people are gonna wanna surface those things to you rather than snipe behind the back. Now, talk about toxic people and what does a leader do when he or she identifies a toxic person in the workplace? How does a good leader address that? A good leader needs to address it upfront um, and have that conversation. And then they uh, put a plan in place and say, okay, the performance improvement plan, call a pit call, whatever you want, and say, these are our expectations. This is what I'm going to ask you to do in the next three months, four months, five months. If they do not, we are going to have to have another conversation and have con and there will be consequences. Because Dave, everybody on that team is watching. And I'm thinking if I'm a problem child and I'm getting all that att attention, oh, I'm going to stay a problem child. So if I'm watching this problem child get all this attention, I'm a high performer and I'm not getting that attention, it's going to make me mad. And then all of a sudden, we talked about the great resignation. I'm going to look over there. Oh, and then I'm going to look over there and then I'm going to say, I'm out. Because if you can believe it, 63% of people who have bad leaders are thinking about leaving their organization. Yeah, it's probably, number. and it's probably like, underreported too. Correct. That, that, I mean, that's, that's a big number. And, and, and then you have to think about how do we hire somebody, train them. I could go on and on about the cost of that. It's about one and a half times your salary in order to get a new employee in. That's enormous yeah. amounts of money. So you really have to like cut it out, get it out. And you know what? You're either in or you're out. So that's, yeah, I love, that's I love <laughs> that philosophy. I think it's, I think it's ideal for fostering a, a, a high performing team. Um, you know, there's, there's really no, there's really no gray area when it comes to uh, tolerance of toxic people. And the sooner you address it, the better. The worst thing that, that, that could happen to someone as a leader is they find out after the fact, after 15 people have left, that this one person that they didn't talk to was causing all those people to go away. 
you know, your point about people, you know, th who have bad managers thinking about leaving. I mean, people join companies, but they leave managers. They leave people who are in charge. So your ability to impact the organization at whatever level is phenomenal because turnover cost is, you know, not only the the productivity of that person, but all the replacement cost and the training and development. It can be as much as a third of that person's actual salary that will, or even more that will lead to that. So, all right, Karen. So now I need you to think about three things. We, we had a great conversation. I appreciate it. We need to think about three things that we should take away from our time together. It was not enough time, but there are three highlights that I'm sure you're going to point to. I'll give you a minute to think about that as I remind people what I discussed earlier. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors is our sponsor. They also do your generic, I, I don't, I don't want to say it this way, but your generic uh, tax planning, but their focus on tax planning is with individuals of who are high net worth as well as independently uh, owned private companies. So if you've got a successful private company or you're a high net worth individual, you need to call Sandrowski because the way that they help people with tax strategies who are in that income bracket is very different from the way most CPA firms will focus on people who are just, you know, average or, you know, in the middle market. I want you to think about it this way. The way that you would work with a high performing athlete is very different than the way you would work with an athlete who is just good. Now, most businesses out there are doing fine and just about any accountant will help you prepare your financial statements. Just about any accountant will help you keep your books clean. But when it comes to tax mitigation strategies, the more your company makes, the more you take home as a business owner, the more you need some advanced planning strategies. And if your CPA doesn't spend 60, 70, 80% of their time working with people who have these issues, they may not know all of the tax mitigation strategies that are available. So if you own a company, it's a privately held company and you own it, and maybe you had a liquidation event, or maybe you're, you've just been very successful, you need to give Sandrowski a call because they can save you a lot of money on your taxes. Reach out to them at 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, they're a CPA firm with a different perspective. My guest today on the Inside BS Show has been Karen Colligan. She's a founder and principal of People Think. She's a leadership expert. If you want to hone your leadership skills, you got to call this number, 415-710-2264. 415-710-2264. Okay, Karen, what are three things we should take away from our time together? Okay, Dave, the first thing is ownership. You have to take ownership of your own career and uh, really map out what you want and then put some plan in place. You have to have a plan if you really want to move through your career. Second is then you have to be accountable and responsible to what you do for a living. Do what you say, say what you do, and make sure that you are on track around that career plan. It's really important to have that growth mindset where you're curious, that you have a heart. I mean, we have a head, we have a heart. When you're a leader, your heart needs to be way bigger than that head, is what I'll say about that. And the third thing is go to peoplethink.biz, B-I-Z website, um, set up a discovery call with me, look at the Keep It Real uh, leadership program. We are kicking off one April 26th. The next one will be June 16th. I have podcasts, blogs, anything you want to know uh, about leadership is going to be there. It's free. Download, take it, and, um, and please set up a discovery call. I'd love to chat with you about leadership. All right. Great advice. Thank you, Karen. You can reach out to Karen. Go to peoplethink.biz, set up that discovery call, or just reach out to her, 415-710-2264. 415-710-2264. Karen, it has been a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Dave, thank you so much. Fun. We could just talk and talk and talk. I <laughs> know. This was a great conversation. We will absolutely do it again. Folks, that'll do it for this episode of the Inside BS Show. 
I can't wait to see you back here tomorrow for another great guest. Thanks for joining us today for this conversation on leadership. Until tomorrow, I'm Dave Lorenzo, and here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.